Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and today's video we're going to focus on these two-dimensional equations of equilibrium. So fundamentally taking the free body diagrams that we took a look at in the last set of lecture videos and applying those equations of equilibrium, which we also talked about briefly in those previous lecture videos. So in a two-dimensional sense, the basic equations are that we want to sum all of our forces um, in all directions equal to zero and then sum all of our moments equal to zero. Now, 90 probably percent of the time, the fundamental equations which we'll use will typically be some force x equals zero. So we'll put here typically, we're gonna use some force in the x equal to zero some force in the y equal to zero and a moment equation, some moment about some point equal to zero. Now there's actually a whole chapter in your book looking at solving strategies. And these solving strategies essentially discuss that not only does the point around which we take our moment matter, that really is one of the key um, tools that you have to make your computations harder or easier, but technically you could even solve a problem with three sum of moment equations as long as those points or summing moments around are not in one single line. Okay, so what I'll typically do is start with these three and take a look at those considering solving the problem. And if I don't think these are gonna be the most efficient, then I'll go to some other ones, okay? So these are kind of like the default. Now noting that these will solve any problem. So it doesn't matter if you use these or other equations, you'll still get the same answers, but you can only have three equations on 2D. Okay, so fundamentally there are three degrees of freedom of motion. Therefore, there are three independent equations of equilibrium. If you write a fourth one, if you do everything correctly, you'll end up with an answer like three equals three. And you're like, hmm, I already knew three equals three, right? It doesn't actually add any additional information. So if you only have three equations, you wanna make sure you only have three unknowns on your free body diagram. So that'll be another thing we'll talk about today. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple example problems. The first example problem, let's say that we have a rectangular panel and this rectangular panel has a slot going through the middle here. This slot is at 15 degrees from horizontal and it is supported by a roller, a roller down here at the lower left corner, another roller up here at the upper right corner, and then there is a pin which is residing inside this smooth slot. Okay, so it's gonna be a smooth, a pin in a smooth slot. And the external loads applied, we have a couple. This couple is equal to four pound feet. And then we have a horizontal force pulling in the lower corner here of two pounds. Okay, so the way this thing would be set up is we, this would be our problem sketch and the problem statement would say, find the reactions and giving some lettered points. Let's call this lower left corner here A Let's call this top corner up here B, and let's call this pin here C. So find the reactions at A, B, and C. Okay, so this is how an equilibrium problem is framed. It may say find the reactions in order to create equilibrium, but really anytime you see this keyword here, reactions, that should key in your brain that this is an equilibrium problem. So the first thing we need to do with this is we need to create a free body diagram. And you remember the first step in your free body diagram is to isolate. So I'm gonna redraw this rectangular body. I am not going to add those forces over the top of the problem sketch. Essentially, I need to replace the supports with reactions, okay? And then number two in our free body diagram said to add an axis system. Let's go ahead and use a standard axis system, Cartesian X and Y. Then I'm gonna add my loads. So my loads would be this couple, four pound feet, and then also here, two pounds. 
Now I get into my reactions. I have a roller at A. Let's assume that that roller provides a normal force. Call this A sub Y. I have another roller at B. Now, just for the sake of, ex of an example here, let's assume that the reaction at B is going to the right. Now, I know that that's a roller and B couldn't actually provide that kind of reaction, but let's go ahead and see what happens to the math if we make this incorrect assumption on the direction of a reaction force. Okay, it turns out we'll be totally fine. And then the last one we have here is another normal force coming from that pin at C. And so I'm going to call this force C, noting that I could break C if I wanted to into components. I'm going to draw these with a dotted line, okay, Cx and Cy, and bringing in that 15 degree angle. Right, if we had that this was 15 degrees from horizontal, then that translates to this being 15 degrees from vertical because C is perpendicular to the slot. Now, the last thing that I need to add on to here, if I'm going to take some moments, I better know some dimensions. And so the dimensions in this problem are that um, C is located a distance of three feet to the right of A, and then it's an additional two feet. Didn't get that quite quite drawn proportionally, but not too far off. And then C is centered here, um, 1.5 feet and 1.5 feet. So this gets into that whole thing about whether you need dimensions on your free body diagram. If you have your dimensions right here on your problem sketch, I am totally fine with you not redrawing those on your free body diagram. But I do need to have all my forces and my couples. Now, notice not on this free body diagram, we have not yet drawn the R cross F moments, which come from these forces. Okay, that'll show up in our equations. But right here for the free body diagram, that doesn't show up yet. Okay, so now we're going to get into our equations of equilibrium. And I'm going to go with a standard three equations, some force X, some force Y, some moment. So my sum of forces in the X direction, we know this is equal to zero. Okay, so rewriting that according to our problem, we have the following forces. We have um, no AY force, right? There's no component of AY that's in the X. We do have BX that's in the y, excuse me, X direction. So BX, that's positive according to our axis system. We also have two pounds applied down there in the lower right corner. And then finally, we have the component of C. And looking at my 15 degree angle, I can see that this is going to be C sine of 15, right, for the opposite side there. So also in the positive direction, so C sine of 15, and this is equal to 0. As I look now at the sum of forces in the Y direction equal to 0, my forces in the Y, I have AY. I also have, let's see, no two, nothing from the two pounds. I think I just have Cy plus, so C, and this is going to be the cosine of 15. That is pointing upwards. Upwards is positive with the y-axis. That's positive, and this is equal to 0. And the last equation, now here's where we have some strength of, of choice. We can sum moments about any point we want. I'd probably pick A, B, C, maybe the lower right corner. I'm going to pick somewhere where my lines of action, multiple lines of action, ideally intersect. Okay, so you remember when we talked about lines of action. Now I'll erase these lines as we move forward because it's get a little cluttered. But there would be the line of action of AY. There would be the line of action of the two pounds. There would be the line of action of BX. And so really maybe the top left corner or the bottom left corner would be my better two spots. And so I'm going to pick point A, the bottom left corner. So that's going to be a change from our previous chapter where we told you where to sum moments. Now you get to choose where you sum moments. Sum moment at A equals zero. So I have no moment from my AY. I do need to add in my couple. Okay, so I look at this couple here, and I see that this is rotating in a counterclockwise direction, which is negative, excuse me, positive from the right-hand rule. My thumb comes out of the screen. 
I see that this is rotating in a positive right hand rule direction as I wrap my fingertips around toward this arrowhead. So that is going to be a positive four. I additionally have a moment from BX. Now BX is located a distance of three feet above point A. And that's going to be three times an unknown value of BX. As I slide my fingers along this line, cross them into that line of action of BX, your thumb should end up going into the screen, which indicates negative from the right-hand rule. So this is negative. Additionally, I have two different components of my moment here at C. Now, I could find my perpendicular distance, work through some geometry. I'm just going to go more with the method of moments approach where I'm going to take my perpendicular components. Okay, I'm going to take a vertical distance crossed into CX and then a horizontal distance crossed into CY. So let's go ahead and do um cy first okay so my distance horizontally here is three so that is a value of three i'm going to cross that into cy and cy is c cosine of 15 degrees and that crossing the r into the f is positive and then i have the horizontal component of the force so i have a vertical r crossed into cx and so this would be 1.5 times C again, this is going to be the sine of 15 degrees, and this one will be negative, right? R crossed into that horizontal F, basically a J hat crossed into an I hat, gives me a negative K hat. And let's see, I have my moment from my BX, the couple, both of them C's, no moment from the two pounds, because it lies here on the line of action going through um, point A. So this is equal to zero. So this is our set of three equations. Now, this problem turns out to not have the easiest set of three equations to solve. We take a look at our unknowns. Here BX shows up, here's C, here's C, here's AY, here's BX, here's C, and here's C. Okay, so we have, we have two unknowns in each of our three equations. This is a perfect problem to put into a basically a matrix type setup. Use some linear algebra and quickly solve it in your calculator. And let me show you how we can set that up. Keep in mind, we need to have all of the variables uh, in the same order. Okay, and so the order I'm going to pick is going to be a Y, B, X, and C. So here will be my coefficient matrix. Here will be my constant matrix, basically things on the right side of the equal sign. It's going to be all the constant terms, so the non-variable terms. I'll move them over there. So if I take a look at my first equation, Knowing this first line here will be some forces in the X. The next line will be some forces in the Y. Next one will be some moments at A. And of course, when we multiply matrices, we multiply a row by a column. Okay, so this will be the, the row here. The row here times the column here. Okay, so the first term I have is my AY term, some force X. There is no AY term, so I put in a zero. We have one times BX, so we put in a coefficient of one. And then we have the value of the sine of 15 is 0 0.259. So that is my the value of C. And I had one constant term, which was two. I moved that on to the other side of the equation over here, and it ends up being a minus two. Now getting into some force y equation, I have one ay, I have no b's, and I have a cosine of 15, which is 0 0.966. I'm gonna go ahead and move this one over just so I can keep things here kind of linear or kind of keeps them in rows and columns, and I had no constant term, so therefore we put a zero on the right side. And then the last equation, I did not have an AY in that equation, so this comes through as a zero. I had a minus three times BX. And then if I add together three cosine of 15 and minus 1.5 sine of 15, basically adding together this, and that, the products of those two terms, I end up with a value of 2.51. And I did have a constant there, four comes to the right side as a negative four.
Okay, so I've just basically rewritten this equation as a set of matrices. Now this works really well as long as you have all linear terms. Okay, linear terms are fundamentally not having a unknown inside of a trig function, not having an unknown that's that's squared, right? The, like an x squared would be an unknown term that's non-linear. And so once I have these, then I can put them into my calculator. So I can put in calculator, and I end up finding values, and it lists them in the order I put them in. Now the calculator tells me they're x, y, and z, but I know I put them in as a, y, b, x, and c, equal to the values here of 2.94, negative 1.21, negative 3.04. So notice these two negatives. These two negatives tell us that we assumed the incorrect direction in our original free body diagram. Noting it doesn't mean you need to start over. It doesn't mean you need to redraw your free body diagram. It's just providing information. Okay, so what I could do over here on the side if I wanted to is I could say, well, if bx is equal to 1.21, I really know that the bx vector is equal to 1.21 in the negative i hat, right? That's what that negative value is telling me. I assumed it was in the positive i hat, but I got a negative value telling me it's just in the opposite direction. It's flip its direction. Same thing here with c is that c as a vector is equal to 3.04. Now I could write this one as components if I wanted to. I could also just kind of draw it on here to say, hey, by the way, instead of going up to the right, it's going down to the left. And of course, it's still going to be 15 degrees off of vertical because it's still going to be normal. And this would need some units. And so we were in pounds for ay, bx was in pounds, and also c was in pounds, right? All three of these were forces. So these would be our three reactions for this equilibrium system. Now, of course, if you were able to solve these without linear algebra, that works equally as fine. We just use linear algebra because we had two or more unknowns in each one of these equations. Noting that we had to draw a free body diagram first in order to create our equilibrium equations and then solve things with our algebra. Now to close out this video, I'm gonna set up one more problem, kind of talk through it, even though we're not gonna solve it fully computationally because we wanna focus on um, one idea associated with this other problem, which is the use of two force members or two force bodies. Okay, Let's zoom back in here. Now this next example, so we'll call this example number two. What we have is a similar looking system overall, just a little bit different supports. So this time we'll have a pin here in the lower left corner. And then we have a cable, which is attached to a wall and stretches over here to the upper right corner. Now in this one, we label this A, B, C, D, and point E is up here on the wall. So that's my two supports, my applied loads. I have a couple, this is a five kilonewton meter couple and a horizontal force here of four kilonewtons applied at D. And we won't use these dimensions because we're not going to quite go that far, but let's say it's three meters wide and two meters high. Okay, so again, this problem would say find the reactions on this body, fundamentally finding the value of the force applied at C and also at A. First step is to draw a free body diagram. We're going to isolate our body. We're going to add an axis system. Here again, I'm going to go with the standard X and Y. We need to add a couple of forces. Now, noting that this is a cable, and it wouldn't technically matter if it was a cable or if it was a rigid body, but if we are neglecting the weight of that cable EC, even if it was a rigid member EC, that is a two-force body. 
because all it can do is either pull or push. Okay, cables always pull in tension. Um, rigid two force bodies can either pull in tension or be pushed in compression. Okay, so this is a tension, and tension always, I'll just put a little note by it that tension always pulls. And then our other support is a pin at A. Okay, it's a frictionless pin, so we're not going to pick up any moment from it, but we will have two different reaction components. Now, I don't know what direction these reaction components are in until I solve the problem, but it's usually easiest to assume they're in the positive X and the positive Y. And the reason I like to do positive X, positive Y is just because then I'm going to write them as positive values in my equation. Okay, it's just a few less negatives to deal with. You may find that these are actually going uh, in the opposite direction we've shown, but then we'll just get a negative value in our computations. Uh, I do need to add my applied loads again for kilonewtons as well as a couple here of five kilonewton meters. Okay, so that is that pure couple, and that is negative from the right hand rule. Right, as we wrap our fingers around there, we are negative from the right hand rule. And so looking at this problem and thinking about what I should do with it, um, once again, I'm probably going to go with some force X, some force Y. We certainly could look at multiple moment equations, but I don't see in this one that's going to help us all too much. Noting that moment equations, unless you can get intersections of a whole bunch of lines of action, moments always take a little bit more effort than forces because you have to do a cross product inside the moment versus just writing down the force components. Okay, so that's just another thing to think about is how comfortable you are taking moments. You have to take at least one moment equation. There's no way you can get rid of all moment equations. And so here on this one, once again, looking at force lines of action, I have AY coming through this direction. Here's AX. Here's the four kilonewtons. And then there is my tension force. I'm going to extend this up here as well. So I really see three different places that the force lines of action intersect. So you could pick the top right corner, actually four places. You could technically pick this um, spot up here on the wall. You could also select here the top left or the bottom left, point A. Okay, so A, C, D, or E look to be advantageous places to some moments. Um, all things being equal, I think I might just pick point A. And the reason I'd pick that one on this problem is that there are two unknowns going through point A. And I like having unknowns drop away from my moment equation because it just gives me less unknowns in my algebraic solving. Okay, so we could end up with only one unknown, which is basically our tension of T showing up in a sum of moments at point A. So again here, I would write equations for sum force X equals zero, sum force Y equals zero, and sum of moments at point A equals zero. If you want to go through and solve this problem, um, I can tell you that the AX value should turn out to be 0 0.20 kilonewtons. The AY value, which we assumed to go up, is actually in the incorrect direction. So we got a negative 1.53 kilonewtons. And then the tension force in that cable is equal to 4.47 kilonewtons. Okay, so that would be actually the answers for this problem if you want to go ahead and work it through and you can check cross-check your work with those values. Hopefully this was valuable in you seeing how you can go from a problem statement through a free body diagram into equations of equilibrium. Once again, if you're looking for a discussion on what equations to select, besides using the standard three, some force X, some force Y, and a sum of moment at some point, you can look at the chapter in the book looking at solution strategies out of chapter five, and it has a fairly extensive conversation about what are some efficient um, equations to pick. Now, if you're gonna be settled on using a linear algebra solution anyways, it doesn't really matter how efficient the equations are because you're not necessarily looking to do one equation, excuse me, one um, kind of single substitution moving from one equation to the next. So it just really depends on your comfort with the, the math. 
Thanks for your attention today, and I hope you're having a great one.